All right, so good evening, everyone. I'm Bruce McFarlane, and I bring you warm greetings from Winnipeg, Canada. And I'm just delighted that you have decided to give me an hour of your evening. If it's anything where you are, like it is here in Winnipeg, I'm extra grateful because it's a beautiful evening. Um, I've been working with uh, acceleration and uh, especially micro osteoperation now. Um, for about four years and uh, I continue to learn and and discover new things about it and I'm excited to share some of those with you today including some recent misconceptions that have been uh, reported in the literature and we plan to uh, get into that a little bit and then give you some new fresh ideas on uh, how to use these devices uh, clinically to help accelerate um, and optimize your cases and also of course make them more profitable. I am a diplomate of the American Board of Orthodontics, a fellow of the Royal College of Dentists of Canada, a fellow of the Pierre Fauchard Academy. I am a mensen, that was a while ago. I don't know if I have as many brain cells these days. Uh, I was an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba in graduate orthodontics. And uh, right from the beginning with Invisalign back in 98 and have been a, a proponent and a user of Invisalign ever since. And I do some education for Henry Schein Orthodontics and of course, Propel Orthodontics. And I have two offices, one in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and one in Thunder Bay, uh, Ontario, Canada. So what is this Propel? Uh, it started out as simply micro osteoperforation and was delivered with a handheld device that caused a disturbance in the bone uh, and thus uh, resulting in, a, in an inflammatory cascade that uh, recruited a number of different cells that ended up moving teeth uh, faster and more efficiently. Um, since the, the, the humble beginnings, uh, Propel has really become a mainstay for many practitioners and uh, is now administered in a handheld device in a rotary device and is now also um, augmented with high frequency vibration. So the first thing I wanted to address was that uh, I, I really try uh, whenever I'm sharing information uh, to make sure that what I'm uh, backing is actually uh, well done with, with science. And I think of all of the acceleration methods that are out there today, um, micro osteoperforation as administered with a Propel device has actually got the best uh, pedigree when it comes to pure science. And in particular, uh, the sort of launching study was published uh, in our own AJO DO back in, uh, in 2013. And uh, they found in a sp split mouse study that uh, the uh, micro osteoperforated side, uh, the teeth moved faster by a, by a factor of 2.3 times. So um, this is quite compelling to me. And of course, at the time, uh, had a lot of my systems and, uh, and everything together and humming along nicely in my practice. And so um, something like this to come along and, and add um, a new dimension of velocity to the tooth movement was very interesting. Uh, and I was very pleased that uh, it was published in, a, uh, in our own refereed journal and that it was backed by some pure scientists um, out of New York University. So basically they found on the one side that canine retraction, uh, although it was done exactly the same way mechanically on both sides, uh, went two and a half, almost two and a half times faster on the uh, perforated side. So you can see that um, the canine uh, where the mops are used, micro osteoperforations were used, actually uh, moved uh, quite a bit faster than the, than the uh, non-mop side, despite using the same amount of force and the same uh, uh, mechanical setup. So excellent study um, and uh, it has withstood the test of time, absolutely. Um, this is from, uh, Alakani's textbook as well, which which shows a little more detail on the um, on the study that actually resulted 
in um, MOPs coming into clinical use. And you can see that um, the perforations are made uh, in the bone, actually right through the alveolar mucosa, so there's no need for any sort of flap or, um, or any sort of uh, Wilkodonics type procedures. Instead, uh, the devices are designed to perforate directly through the mucosa, uh, through the cortical bone and into the cancellous bone and cause the, uh, that before mentioned cascade of activity. So here's how it goes. Basically, a lo localized injury causes some inflammation. This results in cytokine production, which are the messengers that increase the rate of bone remodeling and decrease the bone density. And when we're talking about it to our patients, uh, we use other words, of course. Uh, we tend to talk about it like uh, we're going to put some dimples into the bone around the teeth, and we're going to soften the bone temporarily. And, uh, th and that's going to help us move these teeth much more efficiently and faster. And people kind of get that kind of languaging. I get a lot of questions about, well, you know, if it moves that fast, is it going to be as stable? Uh, and the answer is yes, because the, te the effect is temporary. And um, we actually find that once it's, uh, it's over, uh, the bone density uh, goes back to its original state. Um, some people say, well, you know, are my roots going to be jeopardized by this? And the answer on that one is no. Uh, we find that that uh, the effect is such that the, the roots actually have an easier um, an easier go through the bone, and therefore less uh, less chance of root resorption as well. So it's all been very positive and well accepted in my office. Uh, instructions we give our patients are, you know, a little rinse until you see the dimples go away. Usually about three times a day, we use Perio X or one of those. Um, we, do, we ask them to avoid anti-inflammatories such as uh, Advil or Aleve uh, because we actually want to let some inflammation happen because that's what allows the, the effect to occur. Um, the effect lasts for about uh, three months altogether and it is in a three-dimensional halo around the perforation. Uh, of about eight to 10 millimeters. So, uh, you know, at first we were doing it very often and uh, a lot in a certain area, but uh, we've discovered since then that uh, one need not do it quite so often with the perforations. And also you can count on a nice little kind of uh, window of, uh, of effect uh, well beyond the area of, of, uh, of osteoperforation. So really good news on the micro osteoperforation and uh, we've been shown over and over again in a clinical setting that it, that it truly is effective and well received by patients. Uh, and then along came this study and, and uh, of course it's sort of an elephant in the, in the room and, and online uh, a lot of uh, my sort of Facebook colleagues jumped on this and said hey you know these guys it looks like they kind of repeated the same study and actually found uh, that micro osteoperforations did not accelerate tooth movement. Uh, and they found the exact, the, they did the kind of split mouse study thing, and they found that uh, the amount of, the, the uh, amount of tooth movement and the velocity of tooth movement were very similar on the MOP and the control size. Uh, but if you look at the study, <laughs> carefully, uh, you have to see something, a, a glaring uh, misconception. Um, so here's what they concluded. The three micro perforations, micro osteoperforations did not accelerate tooth movement. But if you look more carefully, uh, and I'll highlight it here, the MOPs were performed using mini screws. So that is a problem. Um, Mini screws or temp temporary anchorage devices um, are quite a bit different than the screw that is used for micro osteoperforation. Uh, a mini screw is to be to be used to anchor in the bone, um, and you, one wants mini screws uh, to go in peacefully, uh, grab a hold of the bone, and stay there and be used until until they're usefulness is over, and then you want to be able to back them out and, and take them away. The microosteoperforation devices that are truly 
for micro osteoperforation from Propel Orthodontics are to come in like a wrecking ball. And that is the difference. Uh, so it's absolutely expected that mops performed using mini screws would, would not create the kind of um, disturbance that is necessary for this accelerated tooth movement. So it really does matter what you use. And I hear that a lot when I give this uh, course um, to practitioners, they say, geez, you know what, why don't I just use like a handpiece with a, with a burr on it? Why don't I use a TAD? And the answer is uh, you're, we're not getting what we want. We want micro fracture. Um, we don't want something that's gonna go in smoothly and, and, uh, and then be backed out later on. Um, and the, the best analogy that I've seen is we want it to actually not make a hole, but instead um, be like a, a rock to your windshield that actually shatters, or, or perhaps in Canada, uh, a skate to the ice, uh, and you'll see the, uh, this, this sort of shattering network. Uh, away from the area where the where the blade has hit the ice, and we want that we want that radiating micro fracture because that's what stimulates the cytokine release. Um, and in fact, it would be disadvantageous for a TAD to do that because uh, that would cause some inflammation and the TAD would likely fail. So the TADs are are structurally designed to actually be very very peaceful and not cause microfractures on the way in. Uh, and therefore, one cannot equate um, use of a TAD with micro osteoperforation. Um, so uh, if, if you take away either of the, the uh, these um, microfracture creating type devices, then of course, you're not going to get the, uh, the effect that you want. Um, so the the Propel devices are, are patented and they are well researched and they are absolutely made for causing a disturbance in the bone as opposed to a TAD, which is designed to go in nice and peacefully, stay there, and then uh, be ready to be backed out when, they, when they've done their thing. Uh, Propel, once again, we go in uh, and then we back it out right away as well. It just goes in, it does its, uh, its disturbance and then uh, it backs out. And of course, TADs are meant to stay for a while while they're useful. So it, uh, that I think that it, it was kind of unfortunate that the authors actually used the words micro osteoperforation. They said, hey, you know, uh, th this didn't work, but uh, they were equating the use of a TAD with the micro osteoperforation device. So the idea is don't use things that aren't. Um, micro osteoperforation devices uh, to try and get the same effect because you won't. Um, another reason why I feel good about being a proponent for Propel is, uh, is, is encapsulated in uh, this textbook, which actually I'm really bad these days at, at reading books, but this one is actually a really good read. And uh, Manny Alakani and his, uh, and his group at NYU uh, did a really nice job of showing me exactly all of the the, the lead up to uh, how this came about and also um, the, the really good science that went behind it. So very uh, clear and concise uh, diagrams and descriptions of, of what went on. And once again, I feel pretty good about the pure science that's behind this as opposed to some anecdotal evidence with some of the other devices that are out there. This is kind of what the, the um, manual device looks like. The, when I'm using the manual device, I actually like to use this one because it has a nice little, uh, a nice little indicator in, on it as to how deep you're going. And uh, generally, we want to get through the mucosa and uh, through the cortical bone and into the cancellous bone, and that's where it, where it makes its effect. And then there's this pretty good um, bubble around it of eight to 10 millimeters of effect in three dimensions and it lasts about uh, about 12 weeks. So um, that's what we're after with this. And um, it's really a nice delivery system. And uh, this this part of this type of device is uh, autoclavable and then the, uh, the actual blade 
and its encapsulation is a single-use device that is to be uh, discarded after its single-use as a sharp. So the, um, the reason why we want different thicknesses is there are various thicknesses of mucosa, of course, throughout the mouth, and uh, and we only want we want to go in uh, th and get through the uh, all of the cortical bones. Sometimes it's thicker in certain places as well. So you'll see me go in, you know, about three millimeters uh, in the anterior and sometimes in the early premolar areas, and then further back five millimeters. And uh, in the palate, also five and sometimes seven millimeters. So just uh, make sure, and you can feel it, especially with the handheld device, you'll feel the various uh, resistances that you get as you go through the various tissues. And uh, that, that will help you to make sure that you're getting in to where it's being most effective. So here it is in the, in the mouth. And yes, we use it with braces. Yes, we use it with aligners as well. Um, we generally have a radiograph in front of us so we can visualize where the roots are. Uh, I think that uh, th it, it actually is not the end of the world if you hit a root uh, and you can feel it, and especially if you're not using a uh, deep anesthetic, uh, the patient will let you know as well if you're close to a root. But uh, generally, there's very little long-term consequence to nudging uh, a root with this. Uh, we, but, but we try and go between the roots and usually in a nice column between the roots. Um, the other thing you can imagine is we use it for anchorage um, as well, and I'll show you that in a moment. You can pretty well micro osteoperforate in the direction that you want things to go, and that actually can help you um, to have movements go in certain ways, but not in other ways. And uh, that is unique to this mop idea because uh, most of the others, they deliver the same effect pretty well all over the mouth, whereas microsteoperforation can be very targeted. Uh, the other cool thing is that we get up to where it really counts, and that is near the center of uh, rotation of the root uh, or the center of resistance in the root, which is generally about two thirds up the root of a tooth. So kind of neat that we can put it uh, where we want it and uh, be rather site specific about it and therefore direct the tooth movements uh, in the directions that we want. So uh, very, very interesting science behind this. And I continue to be impressed with how Propel has been, has been sure to, um, to, to make sure that, that what they're saying is actually backed by solid, by solid uh, study. So the idea of, of uh, us only being able to apply forces with braces and aligners at the crown of the tooth, um, we're, we're all aware of how relatively inefficient that is and how one must be patient if you want to get bodily movement. But uh, of course, if you're able to get some biologic effect closer to the center of the of resistance of the tooth or even closer to the apex of the tooth, then that kind of, uh, levels things out and gets you a much better chance at bodily movement of these teeth. Um, here's that idea of, of uh, using microosteoperforation in a direction that you want the teeth to go uh, and not in the other direction. So for instance, we wanna upright this molar, uh, we're gonna microosteoperforate behind it uh, and we're gonna get a much better effect out of this than if we don't or if we microosteoperforate in front of it. So kind of neat that we can be targeted, we can be close to the root, and we can be very effective and efficient with this system. And we can use it for anchorage control as well. So lots of cool things that I've learned along the way, and uh, I just wanted to share with you tonight. So acceleration is a very routine word in my offices, and uh, we often don't necessarily introduce it on the first appointment. Quite often I wait for what we call that magic moment where the patient, uh, looks, sees their clean check, or they uh, have a few days with braces on and they get back to me and they go, oh dear, is there some way that this can be sped up? And the answer nowadays, of course, is yes. And the way we present it is we will put little dimples in the bones, we'll soften the bone, and we are going to speed up the braces by about, uh, almost two times, uh, usually sort of understated a little bit, and, or, and, or we're gonna go to a three-day uh, Invisalign uh, aligner changes, and it's been awesome. Uh, at that moment, we usually tack on, in my office, around $500, because we also 
be besides uh, microosteal perforation now, we almost always follow it up with high frequency vibration and we're getting some nice synergy from those two systems, both from propel orthodontics. So very routine in my office uh, is microosteal perforation and high frequency vibration. And also to Propel's credit, they haven't come out and said that their vibration is, an, is a true accelerator or it does anything uh, like special with, um, with blood flow or anything like that. Although I, I do honestly think that there is some effect there. Uh, they say it's an aligner seater and, uh, and, a, and a pain obtunder and anything beyond that, uh, they're not really claiming as so uh, um, because they haven't, we haven't seen like a great deal of, um, of science on that. And I think you can contrast that to other companies that have come out and really stated that just from pure vibration. Um, the, the other secrets to um, Propel's vibrations are there are high frequency, uh, which is a uh, better range, a higher frequency than a lot of the other products that are out there. And also they only have to be used five minutes a day and they're used with the aligners in and there's not special mouthpieces for everyone and they don't uh, just all of a sudden die on you as well. So all these things make high frequency vibration in my office uh, a nice uh, synergistic uh, augmentation to microosteal perforation. So here's Amanda, um, typical adult patient. She has worn braces before and of course didn't wear retainers or you know, patients say, well, my wisdom teeth came in and they messed everything up. You go, yep, 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 of course. Uh, but here we go. We are going to uh, set her up with 18 uh, Invisalign aligners. And of course we use the uh, optimized attachments in these cases for, to get our nice rotations and our extrusions that we want. And uh, of course not a super difficult case, but Amanda is a young mom and she's super busy and she's a pharmaceutical salesperson and she wants this to happen fast. So we said, okay, Amanda, let's uh, go ahead. We're gonna put on all our attachments and we're going to uh, deliver the first aligners and we're going to place some micro perforations. And generally with our Invisalign cases, we kind of just go in the areas that we think are going to be the most difficult tooth movements. Quite often those are lower incisors or rotations or teeth that whose roots have to be tipped a fair bit. So uh, we kind of pick and choose uh, according to which ones are most going to be most difficult. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't clean her up for this photo, but we follow up with the uh, with the high frequency vibration that is for five minutes each day, and uh, it's done with the aligners in and pretty easy. The patient can uh, monitor how much they're doing it. And, uh, and also it comes with a little bit of software that we can check as well. So 51 days later, so you remember there was 18 aligners. Uh, we had her change them on a three day basis and she's done. So uh, kind of neat, she was very compliant and you really must be, of course, if you're going in three day aligners, uh, you wanna pick and choose a little bit and make sure it's gonna be a patient that's totally committed to this. Uh, you can see how there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever of uh, where the perforations were done and no um, you know, long-term consequences to the, uh, to the gingiva. Um, so for, with uh, microosteal perforation and high frequency vibration, we got from there to there in 51 days. And of course she's just thrilled. And uh, quite often with these cases, we'll use uh, Vivera or Invisalign's retainers. And um, so therefore we don't even have to take another scan or, uh, or an impression to, uh, to get retainers from Invisalign. So pretty efficient and pretty fast. Uh, and of course you're gonna, I know the next question that is, well, uh, okay, how are you gonna charge for this? We're used to you know, spreading out our, um, our payment plans over 18 months and uh, gosh, you know, 51 days, how are you gonna do this? So the, a few things that we do in our office because these cases are going so darn quick, um, of course it can be quite profitable for us, but we don't just come out and say that. Uh, it's really great to be known in your territory as the fast finisher and uh, um, that, that is really a neat uh, practice differentiator. Um, we change up the appointment intervals a little bit and um, you know, we, uh, we, 
we'll sometimes see them a little more often to just kind of, you know, watch and, and see. Uh, but if if uh, they're changing them every three days, I'll maybe see our patients about every three weeks or so, just to make sure that things aren't going aren't going off the rails because obviously yeah, that could happen quickly. Um, but uh, generally, with with this system, with the microosteoperforation followed by the high frequency vibration, uh, we're not seeing uh, we're seeing the cases track beautifully actually. Uh, we change up our contract length a little bit. We'll have, have things happen uh, quite a bit faster. Uh, we will encourage payment in full in advance. That's magic because that eliminates that sort of money in the medicine connection. And people will say, wow, you know, you didn't even see me last month and I sent you a monthly payment. And, and this, if they paid in advance, and that takes that out of the equation. So we'll offer a fair uh, uh, bookkeeper's courtesy for uh, payment in full in advance. Uh, we redefine the defense, uh, retention period. So, yep, we're gonna do this in 51 days, but we're also gonna watch you for the next year. And that's actually part of the uh, of our treatment time. So we've given you the courtesy of spreading out your um, your payments over time, and, and that includes uh, the time that you're in retainers. And so generally we've been, we found that that's rather acceptable. And uh, people will still pay, and we haven't had a whole lot of trouble with non-payment, um, even when we've gone so fast. So d please don't worry about that too, too much. But be careful to explain to patients, you know, that that there is um, this is the fee for moving your teeth, and uh, wh whether you know, no matter how fast it goes, or um, uh, or how many times we see you, it remains the same. And people get it; they seem okay with it. Um, so in my offices now, we've we've sort of, you know, acceleration is is so kind of routine that I've been trying to push the system a little bit, and I think this is the next frontier for Propel, and it's exciting because uh, my brain goes well if it does so well, sort of softening bone and to make teeth move faster, how about getting me out of trouble? And I don't know for some reason I seem to attract trouble. Um, mostly in, in uh, my, my professional life, of course. Um, but we're now uh, thinking beyond and um, we want to get ourselves out of tough binds using microosteoperforation and vibration. So I'll give you some examples here. Uh, if you do enough orthodontics, you're eventually going to run into some stuck teeth and it's tough to deal with. Um, and a lot of it isn't actually pure ankylosis, as in, you know, at total absence of a periodontal ligament and tooth becoming part of bone, et cetera. That's actually quite rare and usually only after a lot of trauma and that sort of thing. Uh, more likely is that there's just like heavy sledding to move these teeth. Uh, with ledges of bone impeding the, impeding the movement. So therefore, uh, microosteoperforation per perforation actually fits uh, for this kind of um, challenge because uh, the, the mechanism is that um, we cause some inflammation in the area where the tooth is hung up. Um, the inflammation recruits the osteoclasts, of course, and uh, you know how things go from there. They reserve the bone, and we un unclog the system and unbog the teeth uh, and have them move through less dense bone, temporarily less dense bone into their new positions. So kind of cool. And it's kind of my latest go-to when I run into uh, problems. Sometimes I do it proactively as in just cases I know, I just absolutely know that it's gonna be tough to move. Um, like, you know, when we did general dentistry, we talked about, uh, you know, glass and concrete type teeth where they're all worn down and the, and the patient's got bone that's that's just so dense. Uh, quite often we'll think about microosteoperforation for those uh, type cases right away. Uh, we're a little bit careful because this is a slightly kind of not totally on label with, with the system and we're not fully able to look you in the eye and say, absolutely, we've got pure science behind this. However, we often frame it to our patients and say, hey, by the way, the other options are we're going to take a, and go under the gums and we're going to cut out a piece of your bone and bring the teeth along with it. And, and then there's going to be like plates and screws and that sort of thing. They go, oh, God, you're kidding. Or 
we're going to have a surgeon go in and freeze you up and he's going to almost pull the teeth, but uh, not quite. And we're going to stop there. And they go, oh, geez. OK, tell you what, let's give this a go. And the answer has been in my office, a lot of positive things that go on with it. And uh, I've had some success and I want to share that with you. Here's one, Taylor, 15 years old. Uh, she had a pretty darn impacted canine. I see she had a lot of those. Uh, and uh, so we're gonna go ahead and put some braces on Taylor. And uh, a year later, we've got the um, canine, we've got the, the canine exposed and we've got everything on its way in. Um, however, um, that canine, it turns out, is is pretty darn stuck. So there it is on the Ceph, uh, quite high. So a year and four months later, uh, yep, it's coming down, uh, or it's come through the gum, but uh, it, it has actually uh, gotten stuck and it's starting to raise all of the other teeth um, away from the occlusal plane. So right away when I see this, um, you know, before, pre previous to Propel, I probably would have sent her back to the surgeon and said, look, you know, uh, luxate a whole bunch of those teeth. Sometimes we caused the teeth to need root canals, or sometimes there's cases where the roots were broken. Um, and, but now with microosteoperforation, it's actually the, my go-to for this sort of thing. And if you do, as mentioned, if you do enough orthodontics, you're going to see this. So uh, we go ahead and do the microosteoperforation. One mistake I made here was that I didn't recognize that part of the problem was this lateral incisor, and I'll show you how I overcame that. So we right away uh, put in a fairly heavy wire. This is a 21, 25 uh, braided wire, and uh, we get into fairly heavy elastics as well. We'll often wear them, have them wear more of a sort of N type or W type elastic at night and just really get some good traction on this as soon as we've got the system mobilized with the microosteoperforation. So four weeks later, after that, uh, I'm starting to get encouraged here. So uh, a little tiny sigh of relief here, but um, we've still got a pretty good open bite on that side, and we're still struggling a little bit to um, get Taylor's teeth to, to touch. So four months later, you'll remember the effect of um, of this microosteoperforation lasts about 12 weeks, so three months. So four months later, I'm aware that that the effect has worn off, and I'm going to do it again. And this time, I'm going to move it. Sorry, I'm going to move it um, mesially as well. So uh, we we put it in uh, right around the lateral incisor and around the canine. And once again, that's one of the beauties of microosteoperforation is you can uh, isolate and um, and the, the effect and put it exactly where you want it. So two months later, whew, two is coming down. So uh, uh, we're just finishing up and a big sigh of relief in this case. Um, I won't say that this is successful in all of them. Uh, sometimes there is true ankylosis or true primary failure of eruption, which is pretty tough to overcome. However, uh, in my experience and in my sort of uh, in my conservative mind, I think that it's worth it to uh, to give this a go when you run into stuck teeth. So six months and two mops, and we got to there, and uh, and a big sigh of relief on everyone's uh, part. Anna, 14 and a half year old female, uh, another one of these difficult impactions. Um, I don't know, I seem to get a lot of these. And uh, these ones are in the palate. And we're going to go in and find them, of course. And we're going to try and bring them in for Anna. She's also got peg laterals on top. And we're going to uh, do a little bit of expansion on her as well. So there we are. Baby teeth still remain. And you can see the uh, outlines of the impacted canines. Uh, so 12 months in, uh, we have the teeth uncovered. We use those little eruption chains. Uh, With the palatal ones, we use a closed system where the uh, so we'll flap them, find the teeth. We've actually taught our surgeon to bond uh, to the teeth with the little uh, eruption um, attachments and then uh, the chains. And then we use uh, springs, open coil springs, uh, against 
uh, using the lateral incisors in order to uh, to bring these in sort of one link at a time. And to help the system out, we use microosteoperforation. Now, in this area, we generally go in as fairly deep, as in about five to seven millimeters. And uh, if you have 3D imaging, that would be the best, of course, to aim it. But uh, um, it's really helpful to ha have this happen faster and more efficiently. So six months after the microosteoperforation, this is where we are. And um, we got the left canine down completely. Uh, the right one's on its way just with a uh, um, heat activated titanium wire and uh, some elastics. And here we are nine months post mop. Uh, you can see the gingival response is pretty good. And uh, the canines are down and, and we're ready to start talking to the dentist about widening those uh, lateral incisors. So kind of neat that uh, this system is available to us and uh, able to help us uh, speed things along and make it more predictable as well. So uh, from there to there, we had to use high frequency vibration as well. Uh, so the, the daily uh, five minutes with the, uh, with the vibration device, the VPro5. And uh, once again, this is generally in my office about $500 more. I'm not, this isn't a profit center for me. And uh, my, my big thing is, you know, to make these cases go faster and more predictable, I'm aware of the economics of that. And also of my reputation and all those other intangible things. Uh, I really want to be known as the guy who can deliver and deliver on time and uh, efficiently. So that's the reasons why we pretty well only cover our costs on these and uh, not, it's not, really a way to make a lot of money, except, of course, just when the cases go faster and more efficiently, that is where uh, the money is. Okay, how about with the liners? Do we do this with the liners? Absolutely. Uh, what are the <laughs> interesting ways to sort of figure out uh, where you might need some help is from Invisalign's little uh, ski hill indicators. Uh, the intermediates and the black diamonds, I call them. <laughs> and uh, so you can look around and if, you, if you're looking for a good place to place the micro perforations, you can turn on this little TMA indicator and it'll tell you uh, where the tough movements are gonna be. So if you wanna, that's kind of the cheat notes for where to do uh, micro perforation. So this is Nandy, she's an adult and uh, you can probably see from here, a fairly whopping, um, anterior open bite and uh, so and Nandy wants aligners and we're getting pretty comfortable these days with aligners and uh, and open bites uh, both posterior and, and anterior and you can almost imagine that we're going to treat this case almost like we would braces and just kind of uh, retract things back and close down that anterior open bite and at the same time of course deal with her uh, tongue posture and all those things that help us with long-term stability. So here's her pano and the ceph, uh, so sort of bimaxillary protrusion with an anterior open bite and uh, away we go. So 21 aligners and uh, we're gonna go ahead and bring them back just like we would almost with like a, a round wire uh, and um, Try not to use a whole lot of anterior attachments in these cases. We will, uh, if we run into trouble with uh, the lateral incisors, we like the optimized attachments for them and also some extrusion attachments. Uh, those often come in case refinement. So here we are nine months later and uh, Nandi has been a good complier and things have generally gone pretty well. We've got uh, some positive overbite and uh, Nandi's pretty happy, but of course, uh, this lateral incisor is hung up. So uh, right away we think, well, let's uh, let's use micro perforation. This is what they, it looks like the day of. Uh, the little perforations, quite often in this area, I'll do two of them in a column. And we're generally in the attached mucosa and also probably one just above in the uh, alveolar mucosa as well. When we do the lowers, we generally only do one these days and it's it's just uh, between the lower incisor roots like that. And near the back, I might do two or sometimes three in a column and probably go a little deeper because of the thick, more thickness of tissue and bone. And these, of course, are the power ridges. We're trying to get some more proclination of those upper incisor teeth or uh, palatal root torque. 
three months post mop we're starting to get a uh, nice effect here uh, we're going to reboot her one more time and finally at 16 months in total uh, we got her to here so i think this is a nice example of using micro osteoperation and high, high frequency vibration uh, to get yourself out of a bit of a bind and uh, come up with a nice result. So we got it from there to there in nine months, and that was cool, but uh, really not able to move that lateral incisor um, as well as I would, had hoped. And uh, so we put on a new attachment and we used micro osteoperation, and that gets us to where we want to be. So nice little arrow to have in your quiver. And uh, definitely uh, think about it if you run into some troubles um, with the liner cases as well as braces cases with teeth that just won't move. Okay, another one, Susan. She's a, a 42-year-old uh, female, and she uh, really wants aligners. She is tough in the transverse. She's narrow on top. Uh, and so, of course, in a lot of these we go, well, um, let's do that with braces and jaw surgery. And she goes, well, yeah, I've done that with braces and jaw surgery before. And so uh, I don't want braces and I certainly don't want surgery again. So we go, okay, Susan. Um, with a lot of these cases, we're not necessarily thinking uh, fast as much as just to being able to make it happen. So uh, a lot, uh, with thir 13 aligners, that's that sort of, uh, Invisalign assist program, and we ask for it without um, any any uh, advice or progress tracking, and we get 13 aligners, but we actually go two weeks with them. Um, part of it too is a practice management thing, and that is, you know, 13 aligners in 13 weeks uh, is is pretty fast, and especially if we're asking for transverse change and the correct buccal root torque. Uh, I'm actually okay with going a little slower aligner-wise, but of course, augmenting it with um, with Propel, micro-osteoperation, and high-frequency vibration. So here's Susan, she's just like the, the greatest lady ever, but unhappy with her smile and unhappy with her bite. And she's a, she knows what a crossbite is, and she knows that she's still deficient in the maxilla uh, on the right side, despite uh, having had uh, an osteotomy in the past. She can see she's got a screw loose too up in there, but we're gonna not go after that. Um, so uh, what do we do? We set her up for Invisalign. We actually over-engineer these cases a fair bit. I'll use uh, words like give me, you know, the correct amount of expansion and two more millimeters, and also give me some buccal root torque. In a lot of these, we actually have a periodontist along with us and uh, he or she will watch us um, and make sure that we remain safe with the remodeling of the bone and also to make sure that that, uh, that the attached gingiva comes along as well. So here we are, the first round is 13 aligners and uh, we, you can see how we're gonna get uh, a bit of over correction there. This is a way to look and see how much buccal root torque you have in your clin checks, drop off the lower model darken the background and you'll see if there's these sort of plunging cusps on the palatal, uh, that's an indication that you're in need of a bit more buccal root torque. So where we go right away, this is proactive use of micro osteoperforation because we just know we're gonna need it. Uh, where she's in crossbite on the top, we've got two micro osteoperforations in a column all the way back. This is where that uh, the handpiece is nice because uh, it's got a nice contra angle on it and you can go in from the uh, buckle and you're not, you know, sometimes we're stretching the lip back so far with the straight on device, but uh, the, the handpiece is great for this, much less kind of jarring for the patient as well. Um, so I encourage you to have all of the, the tools uh, for various situations. So one month we got to here and already she's kind of going, okay, yeah, this is good, this is good. Um, two months we got to there. And in four months, we got to there. Now we're uh, we're sort of ready to uh, to reboot here, and uh, but we got from there to there in the in the four months, and uh, now we want to keep going. So once again, we reboot and we remop as well. So uh, quite often, the delivery of the case refinement aligners is uh, 
coincides with another round of microosteoperforation because uh, we are aware that the effect is only uh, worth, works for about, uh, uh, about three months altogether. So uh, here we are, 13 months, and uh, we got a pretty nice transverse response. Uh, we stayed safe with the periodontist, and uh, we got her out to there, perhaps not the perfect buccal overjet on the right side, but she's so much happier. And you can see uh, the aesthetics of her smile improved considerably as well. So uh, kind of neat. Uh, I think transverse is one of the most uh, challenging uh, dimensions with adults. And uh, I sure am a fan, especially with Invisalign, of using uh, microosteoperforation to help augment our transverse cases. So from there to there in 13 months with two sets of microosteoperforations. Uh, last little uh, thought before we take some questions. Uh, this is kind of a neat one. Uh, we use VPRO5 a lot, uh, as mentioned, along with uh, microosteoperforation, but sometimes uh, we use it for its major role, which is um, aligner seating. And uh, we have a, we have of course scanner in our office, and we now have a, um, a FormLab 3D printer. And we're actually doing our own sort of little relapse recovery system with a series of little aligners. But um, it's quite, it's quite slow and quite labor intensive, and it's also kind of expensive. So. Uh, We've come up with this idea, it's not my original idea, but um, we've seen some neat things with it. And that is, uh, take, uh, say, some lower incisors that have relapsed a fair bit and might need a series of aligners and realign them to perfection with one aligner. And then hit them with the VPRO5. And that's exactly what we've done. So this is Will, 16-year-old, didn't wear his retainers. And uh, of course, his uh, relapsed. So we made him this retainer and we actually lined his teeth up that were quite crooked um, to perfection with one uh, aligner. And we said, okay, well, uh, tough it out with this, uh, with this device 24-7 uh, in your mouth with a 16-year-old, you know, you go, 16-year-old male, you go all the time except when you're eating and they go, well, you know, I eat all the time. But Will did pretty well. Um, also Will, Go ahead for five minutes every day and put in the VPRO5. Uh, and Will, in four weeks, did this. Uh, so we're kind of uh, pleased by that. And it's now sort of changing my perspective a little bit on uh, how we are going to deal with relapse and not necessarily always just use. Um, a series of aligners that move a little bit, uh, maybe just one aligner that moves a lot, and then uh, help it out with the uh, with the VPRO5. So that's a nice little other little trick that, that we've been getting into recently. So I think in general in my offices, we've, we've really kind of come to look upon uh, microosteoperforation and high frequency vibration as rather routine for both uh, acceleration, and we're pleased that it's backed by excellent science, and I think absolutely of all of the systems that are out there, um, I can look you straight in the eye and say that that it is uh, backed by the best science. Um, we're seeing a nice uh, synergistic effect with high frequency vibration um, along with the microosteoperforation, and that's kind of cool. And, and of course, there's some tricks that we use high frequency vibration by itself as well, mainly for aligner seating. And I think the next frontier is usually utilizing microosteoperforation and vibration to make tough movements less tough. And I think that's going to result in less surgery and luxations and complications and expense. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so pleased uh, that you have given me this evening. And I've tried to keep 10 minutes now for uh, any questions that you have. Uh, you may type them in and I will see them. And uh, I just really appreciate your uh, attention this evening and encourage you to think about in, uh, incorporating uh, Propel into your office for the various reasons that we've discussed tonight. Okay, thank you all. And we'll take some questions now. 
All right. Wow, I did a, such a good job tonight. This is amazing. <laughs> Nobody has any questions. Um, I, you know, some of the, the things that I hear, um, just, just kind of trepidation, especially amongst orthodontists, about, uh, you know, actually, this is kind of an invasive thing. And I, I, uh, I really want to um, encourage and support you in that and let you know that it, it's not too big a deal. I do use um, infiltration, anesthesia. Um, some of my colleagues, especially in the United States, use the, uh, the, the topical, but I feel a little bit better about actually uh, freezing the, the patient a little bit. And uh, I think it makes for a better experience for, for our, our patients. And uh, so I encourage you not to worry about that too much. And I know <laughs> a lot of us went into ortho for a reason to not uh, deal with a whole bunch of bodily fluids, but it's not too big a deal. Uh, and very well tolerated. I'm amazed. We always send a little TLC note or email the next day or a phone call and uh, continue to be amazed at how people say, yep, freezing came out. I, I, I can't even see the, the little holes anymore and uh, I don't feel a thing. It's It's been awesome. And then we have them follow up with the vibration and it's it's been just great. Um, other things that I hear are, uh, let's see, uh, like how how often do you have to do it? And the, it, you know, I mentioned that when we first started, we were, we were doing it too much, basically. I think, and um, if uh, if you understand the science behind it, you've got a good th uh, three full months of of the effect, and it's it's going to be just fine. Um, and so uh, I encourage you, you know, to follow those sorts of guidelines, and you're going to be great. Okay, a question from Andrew Reynolds. Thank you, Andrew. Can you speak to the risks of MOPS with your transverse case and what you consider are the limits of how far you're willing to go with that? Okay, Andrew, thank you. Um, and I assume it's the same risk as with any dental expansion. And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, there's only so far we can go. I had mentioned that we had a periodontist along with that case, and I really, I really encourage that. The periodontist that I had, I don't actually have um, 3D imaging. And so she does, and and she was very careful to watch and make sure that uh, you know there's still a good layer of cortical bone and and that we weren't pushing things too far. So I think it's a case by case basis, and and you really would do want to have some backup on this. But uh, generally, you know, if you're looking for about two to two and a half millimeters aside, uh, you're you're going to remain safe. But I encourage you to uh, to have some some oversight and if you have your own 3d imaging of course that's that's great uh, and andrew thank you for your, for your question that's awesome yeah so i want you to go out there into the world and uh, and create some uh, some lovely micro perforations make sure you're using the right device because as you saw the um the, the TADs or any other thing that you might use that, that isn't actually a Propel device, uh, that ain't the right thing to use. So uh, be safe out there and uh, happily accelerate and augment your cases. And uh, let me know how you do. I am always available, Dr. Bruce at drmcfarlane.com if you have any questions at all. And you'll find that uh, Propel as a company and their reps will, uh, will treat you extremely well. They're just a fabulous uh, group of individuals, and I encourage you to reach out to them anytime. So get out there, enjoy some fresh air, and uh, thanks again from Winnipeg, Canada. Good night, all.